Hello and welcome to New People's New Ways. This is brought to you by Fresh Expressions Florida and Fresh Expressions United Methodist. We explore new ways of being church through the stories and insights of scholars and practitioners alike. I'm Jessica Taylor, your co-host and associate director of Fresh Expressions United Methodist and cultivator for the Florida Conference. And I'm Michael Adam Beck. I'm the director of Fresh Expressions Florida and Fresh Expressions UM. And today we are honored to welcome a true pioneer adventurer in church planting and a key figure in the Fresh Expressions movement, Reverend Graham Horsley. Graham began his ministry journey in 1980, and by 1992, he had taken on the role of British National Church Planting Officer while simultaneously leading a church that successfully planted two new congregations. In 2000, he fully embraced his calling as a full-time church planning advocate, playing a crucial role in integrating the Methodist Church in the Fresh Expressions movement. His visionary leadership also led to the creation of the Methodist Venture FX organization, which has had a lasting impact on innovative ministry within the Methodist tradition in the UK. Although he retired four years ago, his passion for ministry continues and he's currently working on a fresh expression specifically designed for the baby boomer generation, navigating the unique challenge of helping the local church understand and embrace this new approach. Graham, thank you so much for giving us your time there from across the pond. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So we always like to start off with the question, um, who are you? So who is Graham Horsley? Oh gosh, how long have you got? Um, I, I think for me, the, the most important thing is I, I was led to Christ as a teenager by students from Cliff College, a Methodist Bible College. Um, and ever since then, I've been wanting to uh, to kind of pay my thanks forward, really, by leading others to Christ. Uh, so, so that has been my number one motivation, right, even before I became a Methodist minister. And my, my first calling is an evangelist. I just love talking to people about Jesus. Um, and along the way, I discovered um, when, when I was a minister in Hull, we, we, we were on a big housing estate, social housing, lots of problem families, rough people, <laughs> great fun. Um, but the problem was that uh, the Holy Spirit kept leading me into places where I got them interested in faith. I brought them along to the local church and put them off faith <laughs> um, <laughs> because the, the, the contrast between the church and the local culture was just too big. And that's what started me on, on the thing, well, if, if they can't fit where we are, well, where would they fit? What would it look like? Um, and and that, that, I think, was what started my kind of interest in church planting and trying to find churches for the people for whom churches we knew it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that leads me um, to the next question. When I was first kind of investigating Fresh Expressions and trying to make my pilgrimage over to England um, and translate some of what was happening there over here to the United States, People are like, you need to talk to Graham Horsley. You need to get sit with him, get some time. So how did you initially um, get involved in the Fresh Expressions? How were you kind of instrumental in its beginning in there in, in the UK? Well, it kind of started before that. Um, I, I was the part-time church planting officer for the Methodist Church from um, uh, early 90s onwards. Uh, Fresh Expression started in about 2004, I think it was. Um, and so when the, the Anglicans began um, to plan writing the Mission Shaped Church book, which really was the, the, the it was <laughs> Anglican Synod Report, which started a whole movement of the Holy Spirit, is probably the, the one and only time that's happened. Um, miracle. Um, miracle. But, but I, I was asked to be part of the working group because I, I knew several of the key players in the Anglican Church. Um, and, and I think one of the things that's been so amazing about my journey with Fresh Expressions is it's been walking along with friends. Uh, it hasn't been about kind of ministry and church committees. It's been about friends sharing together. Uh, and, and I think there's something really gospel about that, um, that, that actually, if, you, if you're willing to, to share your journey with friends. And so I, I was asked 
to sit as, as I said, the, the only non-Anglican on, on the working party which wrote the Mission Shaped Church. Um, and as a result of that, we knew that there was going to be a new Archbishop of Canterbury, Rome Williams, and he was going to start something which was going to take this forward. Um, and so uh, in, in, in the way that you do, I, I kind of contacted him and said, we'd be really interested as a Methodist church in joining in. What, what can we do about it? And so he invited uh, myself and Martin Atkins and Howard Mellor to, to tee up the, the, um, the, uh, his... Uh, Oh, I've forgotten the, the posh name now for, for where, where archbishops live. Um, and and uh, we, <laughs> we arrived there for, 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 for tea at, at, at the palace. That was the word I was looking for. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and that's how it started, really. And, and as I was planning to go there, I, I went to see my boss in the Methodist Church and said, um, I'm meeting Rome Williams to talk about a new venture. What can we as Methodists put on the table? And he said, oh, well, well, we could we could fund a post, and so uh, when I went for tea with Rome Williams, I, I suggested that Methodism would like to put a post into the new team, uh, and so we we were there from from day one, really. That's amazing. So I I feel like correct me if I'm wrong, but you were kind of doing this out of the box, unconventional church planting for people who, for whom traditional church wasn't really working. For a long time before the Mission Shaped Church report in 2004, and maybe didn't have that language of fresh expressions and such, um, but you were kind of doing it following the spirit preceding that. Yeah, I, I, I think um, Graham Cray, who was the chair of the working party of the Mission Shaped Church, said it was the only time in his life that he ever felt that, that, um, that they, they were rushing to catch up with what the Holy Spirit was doing. Uh, it seemed so often that we were wishing the Holy Spirit would do things, where it seemed the Holy Spirit was doing all sorts of new things. And the the Anglican report, the Mission Shaped Church report, is regarded by many as the start of the Fresh Express movement. But actually, it had been starting all over the place in all sorts of exciting ways. And most of the people who were part of the working party were there because they'd been called by God to do something different where they were. Um, and, and, and as soon as we started looking at what was happening around the place, we discovered that there was all sorts of things bursting out uh, all over the place. And many of them led by people who had been through the church's normal kind of candidating processes for ministry and that kind of thing and been rejected <laughs> um, because their vision of what church was was so different. Uh, but they might have been rejected by the church, but they were, weren't rejected by God. And so they'd just gone ahead and done their own thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it was absolutely fantastic getting to know those people and, and, and beginning to work with them. Uh, and I think for me, then as a senior figure in in the Methodist Church, I, by then I was a church a church planting officer for the, the whole Methodist denomination. Um, for them to have someone who had a, an, a, an office in head office and and some kind of stake in the in in the system to say, "God, what you're doing is brilliant. It's God's in this," were, was really exciting for them as it was for me. Can, can we follow a trail of the Holy Spirit through something that you just said there? Um, because I feel like in the United States, there's a place where we're kind of stuck right now with the movement. And it's exactly what you described. Like I have people in my own church, you know, my wife and I are co-pastors of multiple fresh expressions in our local community. And they come to faith in a tattoo parlor or they come to faith in the, the burrito place or whatever. And our system right now, our ordination system, our lay certification systems, most of our true, what you all call pioneers, what we call adventurers, don't make it through our system. Yeah. And so they're just like, I'll just go do this on the side. Um, and so is it correct that you all kind of transformed the system to make room for those people? How did you do that? Can you give us some wisdom on some suggestions of how we could adapt in the United States? No, we didn't. Um, so, um, I think we, we, we tried very hard. Um, uh, I spent an awful lot of my life uh, wrestling with systems um, uh, and mostly failing, I would have to say. Um, but it took me a long while to realize that actually that was no bad thing um, because the the bureaucracy of the church meant that if you fit into the system, you had all sorts of hurdles you had to jump over and hoops you had to go through 
which actually pioneers found stultifying and which actually suppressed their their, their abilities and their instincts rather than setting them free. Um, and so we, we just kind of found pots of money in various places and, and did our own thing um, and relied very heavily on coaching as a support method it's a mechanism rather than a kind of uh, a, a, a candidating process where you had to go jump so many hoops before you could start we said well we'll start and we'll talk as you go along uh, and, and that turned out to be much more helpful and much more effective and so we have all sorts of people some of whom have stayed and grown in the system some of whom have kind of fitted into the system as they've gone along some of whom have gone off in all sorts of different um, uh, ways, some of which are distinctly dodgy. Um, but, you know, I, I think one of the things which I, it was a, a friend of mine who was a, a kind of a, a mad Christian guitarist who always used to say, if, you, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. Um, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I found that that, that that has been my, my watchword in ministry, really, to try and stay on the edge, which is quite difficult once you get to become a senior connection officer. Um, but mm. but I've, I've always had, my heart has always been with the people who just don't fit uh, and to come alongside them, to coach them, to encourage them, to say, you're doing good, keep going, uh, has been really important. And, and the fact that I've been able to do that with a, a, a kind of connectional hat on uh, as 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 made it easier for them to be able to do their own thing in the local setup so good thank you it's a, a true apprenticeship model of bringing yeah. people into it beautiful yeah. Yeah, I th I'm, yeah, we, we use the coaching methodology rather than apprenticeship but it's very similar but I, yeah I, <clears throat> I think the whole idea that you can take people through a course which will prepare them completely for ministry whilst isolating them from any of the pressures of ministry is just la la land. Um, mm. um, whereas to to actually say, well, well, let's start it and see how you get on. Um, and some people will fall by the wayside, that, and, and that's fair enough. Uh, but many will grow, and and they'll grow to do it their own way. And if if you get a good coach who isn't um, forever saying, well, this is a Methodist way of doing something, but rather, well, let's, let's talk to you about your way of doing it. <laughs> what does that look like? What's God saying to you? Uh, what's on your heart to do? Uh, then you, 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 you find you're, you're continually drawing out the best in people and making them kind of feel good about themselves. Uh, and, and I think so often the system inadvertently makes people feel bad about themselves because they don't fit into particular boxes. Um, whereas God's actually designed an individual box, <laughs> which we fit into perfectly. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and if we can help people to discover that box and to live in it well, that, that, that is incredible. Jessica, you don't, you, you don't know anything about that, do you, with you and Jeff planning the church that y'all are planning? Yeah, no, I was just thinking that's that's exactly kind of perfect of. Oh, your mic went out. <laughs> your mic died. Graham, while, while she, are you back? I don't know, am I back? You're yeah. back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's odd. Technology. We love it. We hate it. It's all, all a good things. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess one of the things I was, I was trying to say was that this, um, the isolation of, of new things, new ideas in uh, favoring kind of old ways, um, really, it does hinder what God is doing in creating new things. And I think it's really exciting to see that you were a part of the beginning of Fresh Expressions um, and that movement. What looking back now, like what are the, some of the learnings that you have um, of the perceived failures at the time that maybe moved the movement forward or something that, um, yeah, some wisdom from those early days? Oh, gosh. Uh, that's a hard question to answer. There's so many things. I, I, I think probably my, my number one piece of advice to anyone who's thinking of starting this is, it's about the people you know, not what you do. 
Um, mm. So spend time building relationships, particularly with unchurched people, um, and and whatever works for them, do it. Um, whereas I think too often we we end up trying to design a church which fits people we put all our energies into church rather than our energies into the people um and, and i think where the things have worked well and, and worked out their best it's been where where people have just been willing to get alongside people build friendships share christ in those friendships and then see where that led um which is much more um kind of um innovative than trying to imagine uh, what the perfect church for those people might look like without actually talking to them about it. Mm. Come on. I, uh, I think this last year, uh, so I'm in a, a new church, um, and this last year we've really heard something said about three times from, and you've said it perfectly right there, from three different people, but uh, focus on people and the programs will come, but if you focus on the yeah. programs, the people might never come. So I think, I think you've just described that in all of your experience. Yeah. So Jessica, why don't you, um, this might be helpful for our, our listeners, um, how you're doing this really well with Love UMC, right, in your church plant, um, just kind of coming alongside friendship, really focus on the relationship with the people. And then there's this system trying to give you benchmarks and things to fit into so talk about that struggle. Give some give some hope for our listeners. Like you're going through this right now. Yeah. So I think one of the things that we kind of take is um, there's the metrics and then there's the metrics that we value and find important and these milestones. Yeah. And so we try to imbue um, into like everything. We're like, oh, yeah, this is the metric. And then that you want to know, but this is really the metric that you want to know. You just don't know you want to know it. Um, yeah. because it's the little things that are huge for us. Um, we see lives transformed here. We see um, people who are finding connection, community healing in this space, and their stories of, of transformation in their lives and them really identifying a healing space uh, where church was harmful for them before and really finding ways to be engaged in church for the very first time. And that's what we get to see because we started on those relationships first, that the, the uh, love that builds in the community. So we, we um, created kind of like God, God, we prayed over what is this? What is this community called? What is this called? And for months and months, we were, they were like, we need a name for this thing. Like the system was like, name it, name it, name it. And we're like, God, God's doing something here. Hold on. Uh, we just got to figure out what it is. We got to listen. And so we named uh, like, love is what came out. And so we have love Middleton and love Eastport. And those are two areas that are under love United Methodist church, but they're two areas that are really uh, creating love amongst themselves, two very different demographics and the love Middleton crew uh, really grows. And this is all people who are not in church. They weren't looking for church. You know, if we went in here and started a service, they would not be in a service. Uh, there are churches that are starting services that, they are not in those services. So it's it's really, what is church? And when we get down to the bones of what is church, I think that's what, I guess, listeners trying to find out what is church start with the people because they think God's doing a new thing. It's exciting to see. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think the language gets to be very important as well because when I first became a Christian, the only language that was used to describe religious experience in Britain was Christian because uh, I'm, I'm old. Um, <laughs> whereas now, uh, people use all sorts of languages, which might come from New Age, might come from Hinduism, might come from Buddhism, might, it can come from all over the place. But they use the only language they've got to, to describe what can be a real experience of the Holy Spirit, but they wouldn't use that language. Um, and And particularly in the evangelical church, people start using the wrong language uh, and immediately uh, people start wanting to do exorcisms rather than welcomes. Um, and and <laughs> I, I, I think that, that to, to get behind the language and try and understand the experience that people are having, what, what the, this kind of divine power working in their life is, is, is really important. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's just so exciting to see so many different languages and so many things which uh, the church has historically 
looked down on like meditation and things like that and say, oh, no, that's not Christian. Um, uh, and I don't know where they've been for the last 2,000 years. But, um, uh, but it's, it's the language which is the issue. And so using the appropriate language, not for the church, but for the people who are meeting Christ for the first time is really important. Yes, yes. I be um so I became a Christian less than a decade ago and I always say that the language it felt like I was learning a whole nother language I used to study um which this sounds so crazy to people uh who've been in church all the all their life but the Lord's prayer I used to have to study it and uh the apostles creed that was something that was said in in these worship services um these hymns that everybody seemed to just get up and know uh the church that I had gone to service at. I was hired as a youth director, a children's ministry director before having ever stepped into a church worship service. So I decided I had to go to Sunday morning service and they all got together. They sang the song and held hands and they all knew the song. And I did not know the song and I did not know that we held hands at the end of service. And it was this whole thing and, and this whole culture that I had never known. Uh, it was pretty scary. So I think, the things we value and traditionalize sometimes are boundaries to the actual love and uh, really connection that the church can bring. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Graham, I wanted to come back to something that you, you um, and something that Jessica was bringing out in the church that she's planting. Um, and it's about metrics. So let me, let me prepare you for that. But every kind of when I'm having these conversations, I'm, I'm kind of responsible on my side of the pond for the movement in the in the United Methodist Church. Um, this week, I was with some district superintendents in Lake Junaluska, and they were teaching, I was teaching them about fresh expressions and how they can kind of help it seed in their areas. And in every gathering, it comes back to this metric question. They were asking really great questions. I'm so thankful because they're really trying to figure out how do we actually help this happen? Um, but but it always comes back to how do you measure this? Because it seems like the nickels and noses kind of approach or the only way we think about church planning is how many people can you get into a building for a launch service? So have you, what are your metrics? How do you help the system faithfully measure what the spirit's doing is there a way to do that or i think there is a way to do it but the problem is that it's a way which is completely different to the way that the denomination traditionally has done it um we we spent quite a while with the the methodist statisticians working out how to do a report on what god was doing by way of fresh expressions in the methodist church we, we published a report i don't know if you've seen it uh, in about 2019 i think it was um but it it was quite fascinating for in, for instance what one of the things which really struck me was when when i said well how, how many people have been converted um uh, who didn't formally know christ but now do follow Christ uh, in traditional churches. And they said, oh, we don't ask that question. And I said, oh, because that's the first question we ask in Fresh Expressions, because it seems rather important. Um, yeah. And, and, and it, it really opened my eyes to the fact that for years, I'd filled in the forms every October, we fill them in, uh, about how my church was growing or, or whatever. Um, and, and it never occurred to me that it talks about how many people become members of the church in the sense of members of the institution. But it doesn't talk about who's giving the life to Christ. Um, and if, if, if you make that the number one measurement tool, well, then they, um, the, the success of fresh expressions versus uh, traditional church becomes very different. Um, because actually traditional church mostly grows by pinching people from other churches. Uh, sorry, that's a very cynical <laughs> way of describing it, but <laughs> there's more than a bit of truth in it. Um, where, whereas I think fresh expressions, uh, I think um, George Lings, who was the main author of the Mission Ship Church Report, put it beautifully when he, when he said, uh, fresh expressions is both a fishing net and a safety net. Uh, so it's a fishing net for people who haven't found faith in Christ that they can find it. And it's a safety net for those who are falling out of church to catch them before they disappear into the great unknown. Um, and, mm. and, and I, I, I wow. kind of like that as, as an analogy. I think it's a really helpful one. Um, and so I, I think there are a number of people now involved in the fresh expression movement who would have been lost to the church totally. Um, 
whether or not they lost the crisis too big a theological question for me to try and answer. But um, I, I, I think in terms of active involvement, that, that their energy, their, their delight in, in following Christ and being part of Christ's people has been completely rejuvenated by fresh expressions. Uh, and that, I think, is a good thing. Uh, but how you may manage to make that work with traditional church, I, I fear it's not possible. Uh, um, I, I, I think you, you, can, um, you can ask serious questions about uh, what does it mean to worship God? Uh, because it appears, according to most Methodist statistics, that the only way you worship God is by arriving at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Mm. Um, and if you worship God at two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon, that's not really worship. Um, <laughs> um, and and so, how you manage to open pe- open people's eyes to that? Because we we found that fresh expressions were being lumped in with all sorts of things like um, adult learning, like um, mother and baby clubs, and things like that, which had virtually zero spiritual content. Um, and, and yet they were really worship events, but they weren't categorised as such because they met at the wrong time. Um, and how, how you overcome that, I, I really don't know. I, I, as I said, I spent about two to three years working with our statisticians to produce the report that we produced, and, and it was still frustrating at the end of it that it didn't quite say what we thought it should. Mm. Yeah, on that note, um, I'm curious about this. I always wanted to ask you, how did Alpha kind of relate to Fresh Expression? Was there, was Alpha kind of a precedent to Fresh Expressions? Was there any kind of interaction there that helped birth Fresh Expressions? Or oh gosh, it's a complicated relationship, which is why I'm hesitating to answer it. Um, I think that there there are lots of things about Alpha which work really well in a fresh expression contest. So the fact that you begin with food and fellowship before you get down to the, <laughs> the nitty-gritty of really talking about what the Bible says about things um, is, is really important. The fact that it's informal, um, the fact that you can ask any questions that you want and anyone can answer the questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, 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 we found Alpha always worked best when, when you got a non-Christian who was really talkative who would try and answer the questions <laughs> because they, 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 they would put things that if we put them, they, they, it was, oh, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> Whereas when the non-Christian said it, it was, oh, really? <laughs> um, and, 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 and that that kind of way of working really chimes in well with the way that we were developing with fresh expressions. Although, if you know the the history of Holy Trinity Brompton, who started the Alpha Course, I mean, they, they've gone almost entirely towards a traditional church planting model now um, mm-hmm. and have turned their back on fresh expressions, um, mm-hmm. which um, is kind of... I don't know. I, I find it slightly worrying. Um, I, I mean, what they're doing is incredible in terms of church planting, but I, I think they're, they're missing a huge opportunity for people who are never going to be attracted to a traditional church. Yeah. I think it's interesting that uh, between our relationship with the UK and the US and um, in the US side, we start to see some things that the UK has experienced. And um, within the last two years is when I really started to hear some more about Alpha. We had RV church and um, Alpha became a bigger thing in the RV community. We had four of our leaders who kind of started an Alpha group um, digitally within the RV community as well off of our um, Fresh Expressions gathering that we were doing. So it was interesting when I heard the connection because their alpha was more resemblance of kind of the beginning uh, of what alpha was the beginning versus like what your what what it has become. And I think as we relate that to everything, nuns and duns rising in the U.S. and spiritual but not religious, we kind of get a foreshadow of what our future can be. And learning from you kind of helps that, uh, so we can respond now maybe. Yeah, I mean, my this this is slightly cynical, but I think it's also slightly slightly perceptive. Is is that the the content, the official content? If if you buy the Alpha course and look at the the content of these twelve sessions, it's a while since I've done it. We we were one of the early adopters. We used it a lot when I was in in Oldham, where we planted two churches. We we, we ran it two three times a year. 
um, and, and with considerable success. Uh, but one thing that we found very early on was that the, the content of the talks was, was kind of um, designed to sell it to evangelical churches, uh, but was actually quite ineffective at meeting the spiritual needs of, of the spiritual seekers who attended it. Uh, and when we first started, the, the, the group leaders, when we got to the group discussion, would spend ages reading the books and preparing themselves for the questions. And after about the second or third time through, they didn't bother because they knew that what would happen was that they, they, you, would, you would say any questions. And the first question that would be asked would be nothing whatever to do with the, the, the night's presentation that we just watched, either, either watching Nicky Gumbel on, on, on video, or watching me or, or David, my, my, my assistant, uh, do, doing um, live. Uh, and it, it would be something totally out of left field. And, and we'd spend the whole evening there. And it was great. Um, but uh, I, I think you, you, you kind of, the two things which Alpha does brilliantly is talk about the centrality of Christ and the crucifixion. Um, and the importance of the Holy Spirit in in in, in the new birth, um, and and I think those two things you, you 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 need to be careful to make sure you you, you keep those in somehow, and and uh, it doesn't matter if, if if that doesn't come in week three and week six or whichever weeks they're, they're, they're meant to come in, but it's got to be a major part of what you do because those are the two life changing bits of Alpha, is is a meeting with Christ and accepting that Christ died on the on the cross to pay the price. Of our sins, uh, and it's been born again by the Holy Spirit, and having the power of the Holy Spirit in you. Sorry, I'm preaching. I can't help it's it. Um, really but uh, but um, you, you know, you, you, you've got you've got to have that in. And a lot of Methodist churches in Britain were very nervous about the Holy Spirit stuff, and so they tended to step light on that, and then wondered why uh, the the new birth didn't stick with people. It was because they're trying to deliver the new birth in their own strength, not God's strength, which is mm. why you need the Holy Spirit. Um, but but as far as each week went, the questions were, 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 were just totally out of left field almost all the time, and it was great. But providing you were happy to go along with that and, and to let the groups develop their own life, Alpha was incredibly effective. So can I ask a question that I'm very curious about? The Fresh Expressions journey. Yeah. What's the development background story. I mean, I feel like the Fresh Expressions journey, when everybody, anybody ever has a question, I say the Fresh Expressions journey answers everything. Uh, just kind of is a very good framework. Where did that, what was the kind of design of that? Yeah, that listening, loving, building yeah. relationship, exploring discipleship. Um. It was Mike Moyer, who's an Anglican theologian who uh, originally drew that uh, sort of row of circles with each uh, thing in it. Um, but I think he was he was trying to summarise something that God was doing and summarise it very well. But I, th I think it was a Holy Spirit thing. Um, I mean, it, it was fascinating that when I first met with the Fresh Expressions team when I was the Methodist evangelism person they asked me to um, do a presentation on what i saw god doing in the church and and not having seen any of the stuff they'd written ready to publish i actually <laughs> gave exactly the same points <laughs> and, and at the end of it mike morning said you've seen my notes haven't you i said no i haven't I've that. that's just what it means to me that god is doing and, and, and he said yeah you're right <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 it, and it just seemed as though the, the whole fresh expression journey bubbled up from so many different places and and it was something which was born out of people's lived experience uh, because they found it actually worked uh, on the ground with people who weren't yet Christians uh, in them exploring and discovering and committing themselves to faith in Christ um, and it it's still uh, I think it's it's a good explanation, but um, I, I mean, one one of the great things about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit takes us all on our own in individual journeys, and some people miss out bits. Some people do all the bits in ten minutes, um, you know, and and that's fine. Um, and I think it's when you try and um, you know make a study course out of it and say so you've got to do steps one, two, three, four, five um, that 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 people start. And well, actually, I'd rather not. <laughs> um, uh, and and so, yeah. 
again, we're coming back to the kind of coaching model, which I think is so important to where we're at with fresh expressions. Um, and I, I think I, I've just been in conversation with uh, uh, Cliff College's principal, offering, offering to do a, 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 a course on how evangelism and coaching are interlinked. Because I mm. think that the whole way that, that you do evangelism should be a coaching journey, not a, that we have this knowledge that you don't have that, that we're going to tell you and then you'll be saved. But rather you have knowledge we have knowledge let's put it together and see what what, what journey that leads us on it's a much more uh, effective way of, of people finding faith sounds like the more important journey that our adventurers who are listening to this who have fresh expressions uh, might in, might be intrigued to know about would be that coaching journey that they're not just starting a fresh expressions, but they're starting something, a journey with people. They're coaching people alongside exactly what they have already done. And that is how we see that growth, that network of fresh expressions become. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if you look at the, the leaders of the fresh expressions movement in, in, in England, I, th I think there's, there's, there's two things which, um, it was actually a, a German Methodist who first pointed this this out to me. That he said, "All all, all you English fresh expressions people come out of the charismatic renewal movement, uh, and we're all people who were born and shaped by the movement of the Holy Spirit in the eighties and nineties in the Methodist Church, and and many of us knew each other before we became the fresh expressions team, uh, mm -hmm. because we'd been together at Holy Spirit <laughs> um, <laughs> kind of conferences, and and so we knew about the power of the Spirit, and 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 that is so important that that you have people who are in tune with the Spirit, and that ought to be true of all Methodists, but sadly it's not. Um, uh, mm. And so I think that's really important. And and the other thing is that that um, listening is more important than telling. Um, and for those of us who are preachers by profession, that that's a lesson which takes a bit of learning. <laughs> we kind of, you know, I I I, I love to think I can tell people the truth of of how to live in half an hour every time. Um, but actually, by asking a question, how do you think you ought to live, <laughs> and then letting them do most of the talking, it's far far better. Um, and 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 that whole approach, uh, I think. Well, you read the Gospels. I mean, Jesus didn't he hardly give any statements. He gave question after question after question. Uh, mm. And so that's very much the Jesus way of doing things, which we seem to have lost as time's gone on. Yeah, Graham, um, folks around here are uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit, too. So uh, it's kind of kind of disturbing because without the Holy Spirit, uh, we're, we can't really be empowered to live the life that Christ has called us to live, the, the fullest life that um, tell us yeah, about if, if if you're not uncomfortable, you just haven't been far enough with the Holy Spirit yet. <laughs> the Holy Spirit makes right. everybody uncomfortable. <laughs> That's part of the process. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So tell us about Methodist Venture FX. Um, what what are some of the fruit that you saw come out of that work? What are some of the most exciting um, things that you can look back on and say this was a a great work of the Spirit? Yeah, it's interesting that, that when when I, I, I looked at the, the the questions that you sent me beforehand, uh, I was I was kind of struggling with this because I thought the success of Venture FX wasn't um, a big success in the way that we so often measure success in the church, where you know we 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 want thousands of people doing something before it's regarded as a success, uh, because actually the success of venture effects was mostly in the small uh it was in the people getting to know people and building faith with them and i mean we we started venture effects because we, we were in the place where um and this is what 15 years ago now um where we actually didn't have many young people left in the church um and where most of the young people that we did were um not normal young people. <laughs> they were kind of old-fashioned and very straight. <laughs> Sorry, I hope this doesn't get aired on, the, on my side of the channel of the Atlantic. I'm in trouble. But uh, what we wanted to do was find people who were gifted at evangelism and set them free with virtually no constraints over a 10-year period uh, and say, you know, just go and work out what it means 
to follow Christ in your generation and, and, and don't be tied to what we've always done in the church. Um, and we, as, as, as usual, we, we started off with, um, I think we, we, we originally said it was for 20 people. In the end, it would turn out to be about 10 or a dozen because <laughs> the Methodist Church cut the funding early on. Um, and, and quite a few of the projects the funding was cut too early because um, mm. people expected to see bigger results earlier than we saw, despite the fact that we'd written into it very clearly from day one that this was a 10-year process and that for people who were doing things which were radically different, it was going to take a long time for them to be successful. And I think one of the things which is hard to get over with um, any kind of fresh expression is that the more different it is from church as we know it, the longer it takes to be fruitful and to be um, mature. Uh, if we do something quite like church, we can, we can fill it with Christians fairly quickly and it looks like it's immediately successful. Um, whereas if we do something which is completely different, it takes a longer, a much longer time for people to, to get enough confidence to say, yeah, this is good. This is right. This is what we're doing. Um, and so we, we had lots of different things in fresh uh, in, in venture FX. Um, I mean, the, the probably the one which has received the most publicity is, is the one which is on the Cornish coast, where we, we converted a, a Methodist chapel into a surfing centre um, mm, uh, yeah. and got a couple of uh, Christian surfers who started a. a, a uh, a church there which is amazing and if you go there now on a Sunday you've got to go early to get a seat it's full um, it, it's mm. it's amazing um, but uh, and, and and they very quickly did something which was it was kind of linked to the surfing community it, it also became um, you know Cornwall is full of struggling churches small struggling churches and it became a place of life where people came for an injection of life which is kind of it's good, although you have to be careful not to let those people dictate the shape of what is emerging because it's not actually for them, even though they may benefit from it. Um, but it, we, we also saw a lot of people becoming Christians, uh, and that was really exciting. Um, we had another one, um, the guy who I've coached on and off for a long, long time, um, uh, who went to a new housing area where they, they literally just built thousands of new houses and, and he went and started and they, they opened a coffee bar rather than a church um, and started with a coffee bar and grew a church uh, in, in, in that area. Um, th there were lots of different places. Um, um, some more successful numerically than others. Um, none of them, I think, Tube Station in, in Cornwall will probably be the exception, had huge numbers, uh, but they were all full of people who would never come to a traditional church in a million years. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that, for me, was the success of it, and that's why we tried to do it. Um, I think that the, uh, the people who... The people who had the money in Methodism were, were, were strange, actually, because I remember when we first started it, talking to, to the Connectional Treasurer, and he said, how many will fail? Uh, and I said, I couldn't put a number on it, but if some don't, I'd be very surprised, because we're, we're, we want to push the envelope fairly hard, we want to do things which are different and difficult, and so, yes, some, some are bound to fail. And he said, in that case, I support it. Uh, he said, if you were going to tell me, if you were going to tell me they're all going to be a success, I'd say, you're not pushing, the, you're not pushing hard enough, you've, you've got to push to the edge, uh, where some will fail and some will succeed. And I think that is a really important lesson. Um, but I think, sadly, he, he, he retired as a connectional treasurer and somebody else came over who had a much more, you know, the, the, the right enough bumps on pews, as we would call it in, in English Methodism, uh, and not enough money in the collection, and therefore we're, we're, we're withdrawing the funding, which is a shame because it was, it was meant to be funded for 10 years, but it will probably hit 20 years before it had a real impact on the Methodist Church. And... and um, They've gone in all sorts of different ways of, of the, um, the the venture effects projects. Um, some have joined other churches or become independent churches. Some have stayed in Methodism. Some have come to a conclusion. Um, but I, I think it, it's sad that the thing that we didn't do well enough was make sure that they were 
really supported by the local circuit. So that, for instance, Tube Station was the guy who was the minister in the local circuit was tremendously supportive, and and uh, it grew because of that, and because. Uh, the local leaders didn't have to take the flak because that was taken for them by the superintendent. Um, whereas in others, the uh, the superintendent was the one throwing the flak, not the one shielding from, them from it. Um, and that becomes almost impossible to work with. Mm. Yeah. Well, tell us about this. Um, so you, you got this new project in retirement, which I think is, is funny, but... Um, you're working with the baby boomer, boomer generation. Well, and... yeah, I, f I feel slightly kind of um, embarrassed, almost calling it a project, because it, it's it's a dream rather than a project at the moment. Um, okay. And uh, I think partly it's a dream because my local church should really struggle to understand what I'm talking about and uh, uh, not being particularly helpful. <laughs> um, um, uh, and, and also, strange enough, I, I've got, um, two or three key friends who are boomer Christians like myself um, who I'd kind of seen as being key people in developing it because um, I'm I'm a very high introvert. I'm not very good at making friends. <laughs> and, and, and it's really important if you're thinking of doing any Fresh Expressions project that you've got people who, who are good at making friends. <laughs> and uh, uh, So we've got a couple of friends who are brilliant at that and, and I'd hope they'll become a key part of the team. Um, and uh, they're, 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 they're struggling because they're, they, they are so used to a traditional church model that they can't really quite get the head around. And, and I'm, I'm struggling to explain it well enough um uh, and so we're still in that kind of gathering stage uh and and i think you can't rush those because that that stage does take quite a long time um and to get people who are living eating breathing the same message uh takes quite a while to 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 develop um and whether or not i, I don't know the, the, there are those who who are saying to me look you know, you, you're never going to get this through in the Methodist Church. It's it's too much of a struggle. Just do it um, and do it for the kingdom of God and blow the Methodist Church. But uh, I've spent too long in the Methodist Church to to, to say yes to that easily. And so I'm I'm still working um, with with the system, which is not as helpful as it might be. <laughs> put it that way. Uh, but why the baby boomers? I, I mean. I, I don't know how the statistics work in America, but in, in England, the baby boomers were the last generation. That, that's people born between 1945 and 65. Um, the, the, they were the last generation where the majority of children went to church as children. Mm -hmm. So since then, it's been a minority and, and a, a, a decreasing minority. And so when you talk to that um, generation, you've got both the easiest and the hardest mission field. Um, you've got the easiest because you've got a number of people who um, gave up on church without ever giving up on God and who, if only you could find a church which is geared towards their needs um, and which they feel they fit in and can grow in um, and not be worked to death because one of the other things about the baby boom generation is I think more than any other generation they're the generation which looks after all the other generations so mm. um, you know you you've got the elderly parents you've got the, you've got the young grandchildren <laughs> you've got, uh, um, and it, it's great and you know we we we've, we've loved doing that ourselves as 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 sons and daughters and parents and grandparents uh, but it it, it 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 means that you you spend so much of your life doing things for other generations rather than from your own um and I, I think it's the same in the church the church in britain is either it's it's generated towards the young or it's generated towards the even older the baby boomers generation um and and that middle generation is one which has been neglected um for quite a while, um, so I, I, I sound like the oh, woe is me kind of person, but uh, I, I think there's there's an awful lot of mileage in that, and you know we we've got friends who no longer go to church, but whose faith in God is still very strong, um, and I'm trying to um, 
And I think you have to be very gentle with them because the moment they think you're you're telling them to come back to traditional church, <laughs> you get a very quick no, <laughs> and, and 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 no chance of ever having a conversation again. So you, you you've got to be fairly gentle talking to them, um, but really to say to them, well, what what are you missing out on spiritually by not being part of the church? I think is a really important question. What what was there about church that you missed? There's there's plenty of stuff that you don't miss. Um, um, and probably we need to find out about that as well, so we'll make sure we don't put that in. Uh, but the most important thing is to find out what they do miss and make sure that's at the centre of it. And, and I think a lot of it is about having a faith which is geared towards helping you to live your life well with the pressures that you're under. Um, and it, it's amazing how little of the preaching at church really touches on that well. Um, and, and I think if if you can only focus on that, then you, you've got a much better chance of, of, of growing and, and of finding that you're helping people to grow spiritually. We have uh, probably a direct relation in the generation after boomers. The Gen X for us is probably that last generation that was, as you said, raised in the church, yeah. childhood church. Uh, so what, given the that we're talking generationally, this kind of goes into the, the next question how do you envision the future of the church and fresh expressions especially concerning re reaching different generations um i find in britain i'm more pessimistic now than i've ever been mm. um which is is sad to have to admit because i, I think all through my life and all through my ministry, I think I've, I've um, encouraged more people to become ordained Methodist ministers than, than, than almost in two or three of my contemporaries. <laughs> I'm, I'm well, well into double figures if, if, uh, of, of people who become ministers uh, out of my congregations. And I've always encouraged them to do that because I felt that they had something vital to share. But um, it kind of feels at the moment as though... We, we are so kind of low in terms of spiritual life and strong leadership that you, you can't see how it can turn around. Um, and I think Martin Atkins, I know you've talked on this thing and Howard Meller and myself were very much kind of three amigos who did all sorts of things in the early 2000s together. Um, and, and we were saying then, 25 years ago that it was it was last chance saloon for the british methodist church if we didn't really get our act together then <laughs> um we, we we could see very little future and and my fear is that we didn't do enough then when we had more energy and more life uh, in the states you've got far more energy and far more life but um I, i've been wrestling with it with, with with a book in which i, I i've kind of tried to um compare and contrast the the emergence of the gentile church from the jerusalem church with the emergence of fresh expressions from traditional church um today mm. Mm. and you know i mean the sad thing is that if if you if you look at that um as as a parallel the jerusalem church died um uh, and the gentile church took over um whether the fresh expression movement is going to be strong enough uh, it, it's, it's probably not going to be strong enough in terms of denominational labelling and structures, uh, but in terms of vital spirituality, I think it probably is strong enough. Um, but it's just how you manage to, um, to hold what's happening in some kind of helpful way, even a very light touch way. I think it does still need holding and it still needs some kind of shaping. Um, and... Um, I, I can't quite see where that's going to come from in many parts of the, the Methodist Church in Britain. The, there are some of our districts who are doing remarkably well um, and who have really encouraged fresh expressions of church in, in a structured way, which is really helpful. But there are a lot more who, who really kind of <laughs> hope if they ignore it long enough, it'll go away. Um, and <laughs> I, 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 
I think that this church in the US is a bit like that in that you have a number of conferences and some conferences are, are, are vitally alive and, and are really getting the fresh expression singing and are really pushing ahead with it and doing great things, whereas others are really quite reluctant to engage with it. Um, and and the ones which do engage are the ones which have, to my mind, have, have, have a real spiritual future. I'm yeah. sure if that seems like a depressing answer, but it's, it's where I am at the moment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for just transparent, honest answer. Um, would you say, Graham, that there's a lot of people who consider the Fresh Expressions movement a failure? Yeah. Um, I think if you if you define church in traditional ways, the Fresh Expressions movement has done very little to build that up because the Fresh Expressions movement was never intended to do that. Uh, and I don't think that was ever on God's agenda, which is the most important thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas I think the uh, God's agenda is that men, women and children who had no faith find faith in Christ and find faith in Christ in the fellowship of all the believers, which to my mind is, is a proper definition of church. Um, but those churches don't look anything like traditional churches. And so people who are completely um, bounded by the traditional uh, don't see what is happening as something which is um, of God or, or of substance or, or of any longevity. Um, and, and I think um, if, if you look at um, early Methodism in Britain, uh, I, I, I used to have a, a couple of friends who ministers who used to collect old plans. Uh, do, do you know what a plan is? The, the worship thing for an area. Um, and, and, and where you would find that from plan to plan, new places would pop up and disappear. Um, and so they were forever trying. We'll, we'll try and worship in that village. Oh, that didn't work. Never mind. We'll, we'll, we'll draw. We'll come back later. And we'll try in this village. Uh, and and that, was, that was normal in early Methodism. Um, and, and I think the same thing is true in fresh expressions, that, that in some places people are trying fresh expressions. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing it in the wrong place at the wrong time and it's not working or, 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 or they're doing it in the wrong way. Um, uh, and, and then you, you get another place where some, somebody tries something and it takes off immediately and bears immediate spiritual fruit. Um, and, and that's going to happen. But I think we've got it in our heads that, that church has got to be the same for every area of our men. And, and it never was. Um, and, and, and I think how you manage to help the church to understand that, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Hmm. Thank you for that. It, uh, in the kingdom, it's one of the most vital, flourishing, resilient things I've ever seen in my life, but there, there's a good deal of um, just the institutional thinking that's stuck and saying, well, this isn't producing the kind of churches we think it should, and so therefore it's a failure. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if you, if, you, if you look at it in another way, the, the budgetary requirements to do traditional church are huge. Because you've got paid staff, you've got buildings, you've got all that kind of thing. Whereas uh, the thought is, uh, I'm about, um, one, of, one of the guys who did one of the first fresh expressions, which we did in a little video that we did, uh, who hired a school hall uh, every Sunday afternoon to, 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 to do his fresh expressions meeting in. Um, and, and he said, it's great. He said, you know, for, for years we, 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 we've had to pay insurance and we've had to do maintenance and all that sort of stuff. Now we said, we just pay him 50 quid a week, turn in, do our stuff and go home. <laughs> and, 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 yes. and it's so cheap. And, and most of of the, dare I say, most of the best fresh expressions leaders are unpaid. Yeah. Uh, they, they do it because God has called them and they love doing it. They, they, they don't do it as a career. Um, and, you, you know, I mean, I've, I've spent my whole career as a Methodist minister, so I ought to be careful what I say. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, the, the, the idea that you can only have church if you have paid leadership mm. seems so alien to early Methodism. Um, and yet it is so deeply entrenched in contemporary Methodism. Um, and, and yet 
you know, many of our best fresh expressionist leaders are doing it uh, either as early retired or or doing it on top of normal jobs Um, and and are doing it in ways which are much more lightweight um, and much cheaper, uh, much more sustainable. Um, And and, and that has to be a a good thing in the long run, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Well, this has been, thank you for allowing us to derail and and go off in many different ways. The Holy Spirit really took this conversation, but um, we have that last, where where can people who are listening to this really connect with you? Is there a way that uh, they can be inspired and connect? No, I've been um, thinking for a while, I'm going to set up a website, but I haven't done it yet. (laughs) If I do, I'll let you know. (laughs) Sounds good. And we will make sure to put any links in uh, if and when you create that website, we'll link it down there below. But to those of you listening, thank you so much for joining us. And on this episode of New People, New Ways, we think that you are listening to this. And if you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with a friend. And to connect to learn more about Fresh Expressions, you can check out the Fresh Expressions FL.org. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and on X. See you next time on New People's New Ways.